SEM models and LVM models, these things are generally complex. And in some ways, researchers that developed these models made it more complex. They, they added a lot to the complexity of these, of these kinds of models in the way that they conceptualize them. And luckily, somebody came along and simplified that down. So in the sake of sort of being inclusive and because a lot of the language is held over, to see what I mean as we go forward, we're going to talk about the complex one first, the sort of the historical sort of conceptualization of SEM models. And then we're going to move into the simpler one and talk about that. But even in the simpler one, there's a lot of holdovers from the complex one and it, it never really goes away. So what I'm wondering is how familiar are all of you with, say, the Greek alphabet? How well, do you know Greek letters? You can probably, you can probably identify most of them, I would imagine. Some of them, maybe. All right. Stuff that comes up a lot, you know, like, and even the, the ones like, I mean, a lot of the capitals, people know capitals a lot, like Sigma, right? And even, you know, you talk about uh, these ones, this is, you know, uh, this is Epsilon versus Sigma, and people oftentimes see them both as E's. Like, this is a funny E and the regular E. This is actually S, whatever. Um, again, a lot of the, the capital ones we tend to be more familiar with were like the lowercase ones were not so much. Uh, where this is the we, we used to this because of the summation sign. This is now the lowercase sigma. I wonder if we should maybe it's worth trying to review that real fast because we're going to see a lot of uses of a lot of different uh, Greek letters here. Let me just say, all right, let's say Greek alphabet. So here are the uppercase ones. Like I said, those are the ones that people tend to be most familiar with. There's the ones that people are most. So again, did you know that that was the capital of Ada? Probably not. We're used to seeing Ada lowercase. This is in order. Upsilon, never ever seen before. His eye is a sort of funny one. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Like it would be. Yeah. And you got Theta. I, I, what's funny, I never thought, so I was actually in a, in a, a fraternity while I was an undergraduate, which was the surprise to everyone that knew me, if you knew me at the time, like, it's not something you would have expected me to do. But I did it, and uh, the reasons are sort of stupid, but I'll save that to myself. So, um, so I was in a fraternity, and, and the, I never thought that there would, there would have been at least a, an academic sort of uh, benefit, but it actually helped a lot in sort of recognizing Greek letters later on. I knew a lot more about them than, than other people did um, in classes and things because of the familiarity with other fraternities and sororities and things. But again, a lot of them, I mean, Psy we're used to as a capital because of, uh, it's used for psych a lot. Uh, again, you got this capital P that we call Rho, which is always confusing. Right? So this is uh, Rho, Pi we're used to, Omicron, great, Omega. We always get the sort of Alpha and Omega thing that you know people always talk about the beginning and the end. I mean, I, my parents shopped at Alpha Beta like as, as a kid, there's an alpha beta nearby. So a lot of these were familiar with deltas, uh, gammas, maybe. Gamma is always sort of confusing because that's a G, but it looks like an R. Um, the ones that, that often are less familiar are the sort of the lowercase ones, right? The, those can often be more confusing because we don't really see them as much. So again, alpha we're used to as a lowercase, right? But it's just alpha, right? Beta, it's really confusing because the capital and the lowercase look really the same. So I feel a little difference between capital beta and lowercase beta, but there they are. Gamma, 
capitalized. It looks like an R. Lowercase, it looks like someone's untying their necktie. I'm not sure what, what this is, but it looks, you know, that's, that, those are, that's an odd one. Uh, we're used to uppercase delta. Lowercase delta is a little, little odd looking. It looks sort of like sigma, but with a little flare at the top. Right? Epsilon, again, E and E. It's fine. This one, again, zeta. Have you ever seen that letter before? It looks like the progress of like, all right, I'm going to start to untie my tie, and then I'm continuing to untie my tie. Off my, I mean, it looks like, it, you know, it's just the progression of taking a tie off. Here, here it is, like throwing it on the floor down here on the with his eye, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's so strange that some of these, you know, we're, we're very unfamiliar with. Uh, uh, capital theta, lowercase theta, look very similar. Here's the eta we're used to, right? Kappa and kappa, very similar. Lambda, we're more or less used to. I would think mu, we're probably used to pretty well. You got nu, where all of a sudden capital N and the lowercase is like a V. This one is, depending on its, its xi, you know, it's spelled with an X, xi. Sometimes people, you'll hear people pronounce it as kasai. Um, sometimes you'll see it spelled as xsi, xi. But uh, it's xi. Omicron, right? You got the pi, looks the same. You got omega down here, which we've talked about with omega squared previously. Phi or phi, depending on how you pronounce it. Lowercase. Upsilon looks more like upsilon lowercase than it does uppercase. And we're sort of used to seeing tau, I think, more sort of lowercase than uppercase. All right, so just to, to sort of help with familiarity of things, because we're going to, I would definitely, in the time between now and Tuesday, review some of these, because it'll make it, it'll make it easier to, to talk about when we can start going through a lot of these models, because they use quite a lot of Greek letters. To refer to different, to refer to the, the different matrices involved in the Lissero model. Okay, let's take a few minutes. I'm just going to decided this was the good time to talk about a little bit of the history of things because the the history really started off with this sort of idea of a Lissero model that uh, started in like the 70s. If you actually look at the the history of SEM. It goes back to like 1918, which is pretty impressive to think this person, uh, Sewell Wright, was uh, using path analysis to model bone sizes of rabbits back in 1918. It's pretty impressive. Uh, Wright later applied, to, um, applied, developed, applied these techniques further uh, to further analyze sources of variation due to heredity. He developed one of the first mimic models and graphical representations of models. What's a mimic model? If it's the kind of mimic model that I'm thinking they're talking about, it's usually spelled um, oddly, and I didn't really put it here. It's usually spelled like M, I, M, and then I, C, like that, because the second I really doesn't exist. It's, uh, it stands for multiple indicator, multiple cause models. Multiple indicator, multiple cause. And it's something we'll talk about uh, later on, um, we'll actually talk about maybe models and how, how to analyze them in a structure equation modeling framework. But it just means that um, most of the time when we think about factor analysis, we always think about them as having multiple indicators, meaning that um, you know, a, a factor has multiple indicators of the factor. But we can actually conceptualize models as having uh, factors that are driven by different things. So you can have a, a, a factor being driven by having similar content, like all asking about depression. But then you can also have um, a factor that is, uh, that is driven by something else, like the way in which the survey was taken. So let's say you have someone take uh, anxiety, depression, I don't know, something else, they, uh, the big five personality inventories. And they, they do them all multiple times. Sometimes they do them on computer-based tests, paper, pencil, sometimes they're interview. What you might have is, is that you have a factor relating all the depression items together, a factor relating all the anxiety items together, and a factor relating all the, say, like the personality items together. But separately, you'd have a factor that would relate all the computer 
test together across the content factors. There's like a computer-based factor. There's an interview factor, and there's a paper pencil factor so that items are being caused. The, re the variation in, in the items are being caused not just by the content of the items, but also the format, the way that they were actually asked. And that's sort of getting at a multiple indicator, multiple cause model that items actually be the multiple factors, latent things can actually be contributing to uh, a person's variability in their responses. He also developed complex crossed cross-lagged recursive models for relating corn production and cost to hog prices, amongst other things. So what in the hell is a, is a crossed, cross-lagged recursive model? What does cross-lagged mean? What, is it, what does lag mean? Something has lag. Falls behind. So what a, a lag, so lags, Usually, or something like this. So, where let's say, uh, let's say we got uh, spring, spring, summer, fall, right, and winter are the like the time frame. And you can say it says really in corn production and cost to hog prices. What you have is you have a variable that is that is here's corn in spring, corn in spring. Here's corn in summer, corn in fall. I'm just making this up because I have no idea if any of these things are actually true. But let's say you have your, this is the, the sort of cost, the, the, the corn production in each of these seasons. And then you have the prices of hogs, as we said, right? Hog prices in each of these seasons, okay? With me so far? It's likely that the cost of corn is going to predict themselves, right? That there's probably some prediction here. And the hog prices are likely going to be predictive across the season, right? What are, what are the costs this year? It's likely to predict the cost there, predict the cost there, and so on and so forth. Where, where you get this idea is a lag. In this case, we can define a lag as a season, uh, a season-long lag where corn production in spring, or yeah, in spring would predict one lag, like, the hog prices in summer. Right, so it's cross lagged. One lag and it's crossing over from one predicted to another. So he related how corn production, say in one season, affected the, the price of hogs. Because if corn goes up in the spring, it's not likely to affect the price of hogs right now, but because I had to buy corn in spring to feed my hogs in the summer. It's, I now have to, I now have to, uh, or, yeah, so, like, the, it costs went up in spring, so I'm now having to charge more for my hogs in summer because of that. Makes sense to make up the money. There may be a, a, a one-season lag. It's also possible that it takes two seasons before you see the lag. All right, so he started relating these complex models where, where the, 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 change in, ver in, in variables and in, in one variable across time is actually predicting other variables but lagged in some way. It could be a monthly lag, a weekly lag, it could be a yearly lag, it could be all kinds of things, right? Think about things like wine production. So the rain in one season is likely to affect the wine production in the following season. There's likely to be a lag. It's not going to be simultaneous. Uh, it's not going to directly impact this, right? The, there's also weird things that happen too, where like with uh, oil production and costs, where um, the cost of crude oil to uh, the, the projected cost of crude oil in the future actually uh, affects gas prices today, which is sort of a reverse lagged thing, right? So if people think the cost of oil is going to go up, or if the cost of oil goes up, the cost of gas that's already been made from previous oil. It was up. It doesn't make any sense. Like they already have the gas, and yet they're charging us more because oil is going to go up in the future, or the gas prices. You know what I mean? So it's an odd. This all these quick cross-lagged sort of types of, of models that allow you to look at the relationships at one time for one variable to another variable at a different time. And again, he was doing this stuff in 1918. Pretty cool. Questions about that? And they're recursive because they're all going in one direction. We're not saying that I think 
this predicts this, which then, which then comes back and in turn predicts that, which then would make it non-recursive. Before we sort of go to break, I want, I want to scare you slightly, because we're going to talk about these crazy things. We're going to talk about all this, this in terms of lister model, all these different vectors, eta, psi, epsilon, delta, is there lambda y, lambda x? Yes. Gamma, beta, zeta, phi, um, uh, psi. This is in uh, theta, epsilon, theta, delta. All right, lots of things to talk about. So this is why it's good to at least familiarize yourself with these letters before we come back on Tuesday to talk about them. Make things a little bit easier because you won't be constantly going, wait, what letter is that again? And all that stuff. So I'll go review some some um, Greek letters, um, both upper and lower case, and just uh, have a, you know have at least passing familiarity with them for Tuesday. It'll make things a little bit easier. We talked a little bit last time about this guy, uh, Sewell, right? You had started doing mimic models and developed cross lag models. We talked a bit about what that is and how that works, uh, but. Let's sort of move forward. I mean, those things started back in, you know, back in early, um, early 1900s, but they, there was further development. So between 1918 and 1970, there's a lot of things that sort of were going on. Herbert Blaylock Jr. was, he's considered like one of, um, he was a sociology uh, researcher, uh, professor, and he was seen as sort of, de of advancing um, research in sociology and uh, started researching causal models. It's funny, if you actually just look in Wikipedia about causal models, the story is sort of funny. I mean, I happened to, to pick Herbert Blaylock, but there's a lot of people at the same time doing this stuff where causal models had come up, and it's like people forgot about them. And in, around the 1960s, there was a group of people who all sort of rediscovered causal modeling all around the same time and started to then further develop it. And it was like, it's, the, the way it reads is pretty funny. It's like, so-and-so was taking a class with this other person who, during their time, remembered that this other person they had taken a class with. It's like it's long, like, list of things and, and how causal models came back into play around 1961, early 1960. At the same time, across the globe, uh, I'm going to try and pronounce this name, but I don't know if I'll do any justice. Trigve Halvelmo um, in Sweden was doing uh, similar things in economics, developing more causal modeling, these sort of path models. And at the same time, even though I'm not really citing anybody around this time, you know, Charles Spearman in 1904 had started working on uh, these, these models for sort of factor analysis. And he, you know, it, it began, you know, early 1900s. But around the same time, there were a lot of people who were also further developing uh, applications for factor analysis. So we have causal models and, and these latent variable modeling approaches uh, coming together around this time, leading up to 19 to, to 1970. So this isn't a history class. I don't expect you to remember all this stuff. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of background about how this stuff was going. And one of the biggest things that was sort of moving things forward is that as we were progressing forward, we were starting to get um, better, faster computers. Now, I think about 1970, a fast computer that at that point probably had about as much memory as a watch does today. But, you know, relative to stuff they had done before, everything was done by hand, computers and things were starting to make these things a lot more possible to do and to do in a, in a widespread way. So you get to 1970, and that was a, a sort of a big year for structural equation models. And these two guys, Carl Uris Cog and Dag Sorbum, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing those correctly, but I'll just pretend like I am. They're also from Sweden. There was this interdisciplinary conference uh, titled the Conference on Structural Equation Models. So Carl Uris Cog publishes this first paper on these sort of generalized methods for analyzing covariance structure that would lead, lead to the development of uh, a program that is, it, it's short term for, or short, um, what do you want to call it? It's not, it's not an acronym, but it's like a, a shortened form of linear structural relations, which they then sort of shortened to Lisserl. So Lisserl was one of the first large-scale sort of programs to do these sort of generalized 
structure equation modeling uh, approaches. Amongst work by others at the same time that was going on, it wasn't like they were working alone, but they're the ones that are sort of known for putting this program out. It's still a program people use today, um, though I, I imagine probably not as often and not as, not as uh, regularly as some other programs. But it was the first program, and it was the first program in the sense that it's, it was the only one that did the thing that they were, you know, they were trying to do. And in these three papers in, in 1970s, they outlined this general system of analyzing covariance structure that combined path analysis, factor analysis, and these sort of simultaneous equations all together. So for a few decades, and even I think still today, in, in some cases, people still refer to SEM uh, as Lissero. Like they, those two things are sort of interchangeable. Like I'm going to run a Lissero model instead of an SEM model. So it's sort of like Coke and, and uh, cola were sort of interchangeable. You know, like people refer to all colas as Coke because that's what they sort of know. So, or, or everyone calls tissues Kleenex because it's the, it's the first brand that everyone sort of is familiar with. So Lissero became sort of interchangeable. For a long time, I remember hearing about Lystra models, Lystra models, and not really understanding that they were the same thing as these, as, uh, these more generalized sort of SEM models that I learned later. Uh, l way later on, I'd already learned, you know, SEM from a few different programs like uh, EQS and M+. And I forget how exactly it happened, but I am going to this, this workshop in Chicago where um, these big names in and SEM, Ken Bolin, who, um, so Klein to me has the really approachable book. So it's a book that everyone refers to if you want to sort of get into SEM. But if you want to like dive deep into the equations and the matrices and all the, the mathematics, Ken Bolin's book is, is the, sort of the, the Bible for that sort of stuff. So it was a workshop that was led by um, uh, Carl Uriskog and Ken Bolin. So I got to meet both of them. But this was by this point, um, you know, this was. 2000 something, so probably they graduated in 2007 from uh, my PhD. So uh, let's say it's early 2000s, mid 2000s, somewhere in there is when I when I met them. Both very nice, both super crazy bright, brilliant people. And just as an aside, when I, um, we were talking the other day. Uh, with uh, Matt and Josie about Jim Sedanius, who was uh, a guy that I, I worked with uh, somewhat at UCLA, and who was the, the sort of father of social dominance orienta orientation, which is a social psychological intergroup relations theory. Uh, he, when he had gone uh, to Sweden to study, I'm fairly certain, not 100%, that he had gone to work with Carl Jurskog and and uh, so we're probably around these times, like, you know, 80s or imagine somewhere in there is probably when he was working with them. So it's like a small world. And that's why he ended up teaching the, the sort of one of the measurement courses and a course because that's where he was taught. That's why I learned Lissero a little bit in the beginning because he made us learn all the Lissero stuff. Because that's that was like where he that was the, the language, the program that he sort of knew. And that's what that's what we learned all that stuff. Anyway, that was a little digression there. Lisserl, again, even Lisserl, even the program Lisserl, has simplified things down quite a bit from their, from their earlier days. And they actually have different forms. There's Lisserl, and there's something called Prelis, which is literally pre lisserl So it's stuff, it's stuff you can do before it gets brought into a Lisserl um, you know, uh, program. And then they later uh, developed this language called Simplis, which is literally simplified Lisserl. So they, they, they even try to simplify this down. But the original Lisserl approach is hard to get away from because most programs in some way or another refer back in, to some degree to the, the, these matrices that they originally developed uh, in Lisserl. So this is where things get crazy and it gets a little bit, a little bit nuts to try to remember all this stuff. But when, you first, when Lisserl first came around, you had to specify, there weren't equations that you specified, you actually specified matrices. Which matrices um, had specific variables and how they're connected were all through these 13 different matrices. So in a Lister model, variables were separated into categories based on these, uh, these, these things. They're, they're either exogenous or endogenous, which we talked about. They were manifest versus latent, and whether there were errors or disturbances. Okay, so you can already start, start, start to see there's 
already six different matrices right there, or six different vectors. And then the way these get connected together are also other matrices that we'll talk about in a second. Okay, so there's, th there's 13 different matrices in the Lisserl model that you have to sort of specify. It gets, even, it gets even a little bit more complicated in the beginning because there's not a clear way to do some things and you have to do these little tricks. The good part is this is the complex. So in the beginning of this lecture, I talked about models, you know, sort of understanding models and the, the complexity versus simplicity. So this is the complex one. And then we're going to talk about how this all gets simplified down into a much simpler model that is the one that's more often used today. And I think even Lisserl uh, started to move in this direction with simplest and other things too. All right. Here's where things get a little crazy. That's what I was talking about, you know, brushing up on your Greek letters and things. So it starts off, we have these different letters like P, Q, N, and M. So, and you can probably figure out but it's not quite what you think it is. It's not the number of people. So it gets a little bit confusing there too. But P is the number of observed endogenous variables. So these are the number of Ys, the number of things that are being predicted. Okay. And these are observed, which means they're manifest. So, so the, the terms observed, measured, manifest all get used sort of interchangeably. So you have these are P is the number of observed endogenous variables. Q is the number of observed exogenous variables, your, your X's, those that are only sort of independent or exogenous. You have N number of latent exogenous variables, and you have M number of latent endogenous variables. All right, so now you're keeping track of how many endogenous and exogenous observed and how many exogenous and endogenous latent variables at the same time. So we have Y, which is a vector of observed endogenous variables. We have x, which is a, the vector of observed exogenous variables, and we sort of start here. These are all the, these are all the, the sort of easy components. We have these, these are the number of variables. So this sounds crazy, but it just, this is literally, let's say you had five x's. This would just be a vector that's x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. Right? So it's just a vector of x's. And if you had 10 y's, you'd have y1, y2, all the way down to y10 as a vector of y's. With you so far, so th th this part, this part's not complicated. I, I, I hopefully I haven't lost you at this point. Okay, so this part is not the, not the hard part. This is talking about just counting things. This is how many endogenous variables I have, how many exogenous, and then of course how many exogenous and endogenous latent variables we have at the same time. Okay, so we're gonna start off with these vectors of y's and x's, and then we're gonna start to try to connect them together. So eta. Eta is a vector of latent endogenous variables. So we have x and y, which are the measured variables. Eta is going to represent the number of latent endogenous variables. So if you have, let's say, five endogenous uh, latent variables, then you'd have an eta 1, an eta 2, an eta 3, an eta 4, eta 5, okay? What letter is that? After your review of Greek letters, <laughs> what is that one? No. This is, where, this is where Greek letters get messed up, right? Because you have, so there's a lot of them that look similar. You have, of course, you have this E, right? And you have this one, right? This is like sigma, epsilon, but these are capitals. This one here is, is a uh, lowercase letter. No? Yeah, so it, it's the one that you often see as either, um, it's usually spelled like KSI or XI. Yeah, you, you'll see, you'll see it's, you'll see it's, you'll see it spelled this way. I've seen people spell this way and pronounce it KSI, which uh, is a little bit weird. It's XI, the XI matrix. Pretty sure. Because uh, the other problem is that um, XI and Zeta look very similar as uh, lowercase letters. So then you have, this one is like the first one that makes some sense. You got E is the vector of errors among Ys, right? So these are errors among the endogenous variables. But then you also have a delta, this is a vector of errors among the Xs. And then you have a matrix where this like this uh, lambda Y, which is a matrix of coefficients regressing Y onto eta. So it's in this matrix that the measurement model is specified, right? We actually are going to be able to say which 
of these, these are Y's. So which of the Y's, which of these, right, are indicating the eta's? And then you have a lambda X, which is the coefficients regressing X onto all the, the Xi uh, factors. So it's how these X's then are able to, to give a, a measurement structure to the latent exogenous variable. Okay, so far so good. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six matrices. Okay, keep going. So in those, those lambda matrices, we're able to establish the measurement part. Okay, so with gamma, the matrix the coefficients of the xi variables in structural relationships. So these how are how you can have uh, xi's um, predict the eta's. I'm sorry, that's that's not even right. No, that's right. And then the betas are matrix of the coefficients where uh, eta's can predict one another. Because remember, once a variable is endogenous, it can it can in turn uh, predict other things. So gamma relates the the the, the latent uh, exogenous variables in structural relationships. Beta relates the endogenous variables to other endogenous variables, uh, latent variables. This is zeta. You know how, how similar that is to to z. Okay, so this is zeta. The vector of equations uh, errors between. So when when eta is predicted by a xi, is then the, the disturbances. And then you have the variances and covariances of the exogenous latent variables. You have this is psi, which is the variance and co variances and covariances of the endogenous disturbances. And then you have, these are, what letter is that one? Theta, theta, T H E T A. Right. So this is theta. So this is the theta epsilon and theta delta. So up here, the this uh, phi and psi. These matrices are where you have the covariances, variances, covariances among the latent variables. And this, by the way, is is a holdover even from uh, exploratory factor analysis. What do we call the matrix where we have the correlations among factors? We call that the phi matrix. And so it's just, it's the it's the same there. It's just because we have both exogenous and endogenous. Well, we're sp separating those out into two. We have the phi and the psi matrix. And then if uh, these are then the variances and covariances among the the errors for you know the epsilon errors, and these are the variances and covariances among the delta errors. And so going back a second, epsilons are. The vector of errors among the y's and the deltas are the vector of errors among the x's. So, how do we specify if two y two y errors are correlated? Well, we're going to we're going to do that in these matrices. We're going to do that in the theta epsilon. If we want if we want the errors of two x's to be correlated, we would specify that in the theta delta matrix. Okay, lots of pieces, lots of places for things. It's a little bit nuts. All right, lots of Greek letters. So let's just review for a sec these letters again. So P is a, is a number of observed endogenous variables Y. Q is a number of exogenous variables for X. N is latent exogenous. M is latent endogenous. So if you look at the matrices, this is a vector. So it's just an M by one vector. N by one. These are all up to here, all vectors. You get to here, and because this is regressing the number of y's and the number of, of endogenous latent variables, it's going to be a p by m, p rows by m columns, sort of relating the y's to the eta's. And this one, because it's q, which is the number of x's, and n is the number of latent exogenous variables, it's going to be a q, q number of rows and n number of columns to sort of relate them together to specify which ones are related in the model. And then because this is relating your eta to your, your xi, right? That's why it's an m by n. This is relating xi's to other xi's. I'm sorry, this is relating eta's to other eta's. 
which is why it is uh, an M by M, because it's going to be the same number of rows as columns. Because this is uh, for exogenous latent variables, it's going to be an N by N, variances and covariances, because this is for the endogenous ones, it's going to be M by M. Because we have P number of Y variables, this one's going to be a P by P. And because we have Q number of X variables, this one's going to be a Q by Q. Mm -hmm. So far, so good. I guess it all sounds good. It makes sense. Let's actually put this together. The list will assume some things. It assumes that E is uncorrelated with eta. The hell does that mean? So let's go back and think about this for a second. What is E again? So let's say it, th it says that this is a lowercase epsilon is uncorrelated with eta. And why would that be? What's eta? Eta is the vector of errors among y's. Errors from This is the vector of latent variables. So lambda y is the matrix of coefficients regressing y on eta. So what are these epsilons? These are the errors. So an error in this way is a, is a uh, unique variance. Right? This is the, these epsilons are the variances of the items that are not related to the factors by definition, right? They were taking, in this case, an eta. We got a bunch of y's. Taking those, right? And then we're getting uh, epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three. So it makes sense that we should assume then that this should be uncorrelated with this. This should be zero. Why? Because we just said that this error, this E, is the part of Y that isn't eta. Right, so these two things should be uncorrelated. Shouldn't be able to correlate E and eta because we just said that E is the part of Y1 that isn't eta, that is unrelated to eta. Anything that's related to eta is, is what ends up being part of the, the commonality that's driven by the loadings in these arrows. Okay. The same goes for your deltas and the xi variables. Right? Because as you have latent x's, latent, um, latent exogenous variables, so we'll go back to here, deltas is uncorrelated with xi. Why is that? Again, because what's in xi? So xi is the matrix of latent exogenous variables. You have this lambda x, which is the matrix of coefficients regressing x on zeta, and then what's left? Well, then the deltas, which are the errors. These are the unique variances. So again, we have a unique variance left over after trying to predict an item with the factor. That error variance and the factor should not relate, correlate. Same reason. So it says that zeta is uncorrelated with xi. Why is that? Following the same logic I was just talking about, why would zeta be uncorrelated with xi? What is zeta? Zeta is a vector of equation errors between the, the etas and the xi's. So if I have, if I am hypothesizing that I have xi, which I'm going to I have a xi1, and I take that and I predict eta1 with it. Now, this isn't showing the measurement part, right? There should be items that are relating these, you know, arrows relating these to measured items. I'm just leaving that out for a second. But if I take this exogenous factor, and I use it to predict this endogenous factor, there's going to be a disturbance, which in this we call zetas. Maybe it's going to be a zeta 1. So I predict this with this. There's going to be a regression error left over that we call a disturbance. 
that's going to be in this zeta vector. Now, the reason why zeta and xi should be uncorrelated is because that's the nature of it. If, if I predict eta with xi, this is the part of eta that doesn't relate to xi. So these two things should be uncorrelated. Just like if this were, you, you might be overthinking this somewhat and you know, worrying about it because it's like latent variables. Imagine this is x predicts y. Right? And then I'm going to have it also predicted by some kind of error. All we're saying is that the predictor and the error should be uncorrelated. So whether that's a latent variable or a measured variable, we still assume that once I, if I take x and I predict y with it, error is what's left over. It's the part of y that isn't x. Just like this, it doesn't matter that it's some fancy Greek letter. This represents the part of eta. It isn't xi. Why these two things should be uncorrelated with one another. Just because that, that's the number that's needed to separate everything out into those categories that they that they have, which is to separate everything into exogenous and endogenous. So we have those vectors, and we have manifest and latent, so those are separated out. Then we have errors and disturbances. So already there are already six matrices, right? Six vectors that are going on. So we take those six and then we start to add in um, the matrices that relate them. So you add in, you add in the errors. So that's seven, eight. You add in the, the, the matrices that relate them together. So that's uh, nine and ten. And then you add in these, you add in these that are um, the matrices that relate the latent variables together, you have you have the latent errors, and then you have all the variances and covariants. All the, so this part here, we talked about this before. This part here contributes to what we were thinking of as the the unstructured part. This is where you can um, specify that things are correlated without specifying predictions and stuff in the other matrices. This also includes the variances that we're going to, to estimate anyway, but it's the covariances here that we can actually specify to say that, like, I, you know, I think there's something going on there, I still know what it is. They're related for some reason. So we can do that between the exogenous and endogenous variables. We can do those between the, the measured errors too, like these are the unique variances, we can actually do that, uh, find covariances stuff among those as well. But it just ends up being 13. I don't think it was planned that way. It was just to, in order to, to identify all these things, plus add in the matrices that, that allow you to specify how they're related, it just turns out to be 13 matrices. I know it sounds unlucky or something. The reason why it ends up being odd, everything sort of it tends to be even, right, in, te in terms of, except that once you have the one extra sort of relating the etas to the xi, so that, that makes sense. But then you have the, the sorry, the etas, not the etas, the, the, the xi's to the, yeah, the xi's to the etas. And then um, like this, the, you know, these, but then you also have an extra one where you can relate etas to other etas. Everything's sort of balanced. You have, you know, um, you have the exogenous and endogenous side, and then there's an extra one where you get to actually relate the endogenous ones to each other. It ends up being an odd number. Everything sort of balances out. There's, there's one for this side, there's one for that side, one for this side, one for that side, all, all the way across, except Ada gets an extra one because you can actually relate Ada's to each other. You want to see that, how this sort of lays out in one of these pictures? Let me put a little, a little visual to it. So a couple of the assumptions before we go to the picture too is that we're assuming we got through all those. So okay, we're assuming that the errors, the 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 zetas, the epsilons, the deltas, these are all these are all different errors. We are also assuming those are all mutually uncorrelated. However, we can specify some correlations between them if we want to do that. So this is it's assumed in the beginning. But this is one of the ones you actually don't have to continue to assume. You can actually change it and, and, and test for correlations between them. So the covariance around the, the size is phi. That's why it's an n by n. 
the covariances around the zetas is in, in psi, that's why it's an MIM. The covariances among the E's, this is the this for, for the X's, the measured X's, that's in uh, theta epsilon, and that's why it's a P by P, because we have P exogenous measured variables. And then the covariances around the deltas is in theta delta, um, that's why it's a Q by Q. So all these things sort of go together. We have this vector of 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 variables, of latent variables, and it, and we can actually then find the variances and covariances of those variables in the phi matrix. So these go together. Uh, psi goes with zeta, theta epsilon goes with epsilon, and theta delta goes with delta. So they're all sort of connected to each other. All right, let's look at how that works. All right, where should we start? Let's start from the exogenous side. All right, so this is where things get a little funny. So we're actually start, going to start from the right-hand side and go sort of across this way. Uh, I guess maybe we can start on, we can even start on the edges and go to the middle, however you want. But So think about this. Th this is the part you start with. The part that you're actually going to, that you're, that as a researcher, you're going to bring to this model are the measured Ys and the measured Xs. And that's the thing you're actually going to have people take a survey and they're going to respond to these questions, have people go through some experimental design, have people do something, and they're going to answer these Y questions and they're going to answer these X questions, okay, whatever they are. So, so that's, that's, that's the part that you're going to bring, that's the part that's going to make up your data. You're going to have that so there are six Xs and there are four Ys, so you're going to have like a 10 by 10 matrix of variables that you're going to be trying to, to explain their relationships uh, to one another through one of these models. Okay, so you're starting off with a 10 by 10 covariance matrix, and you're trying to use this model to explain all the covariances and variances in that matrix using this one model. Okay, so these, what makes these X's and these Y's? Let's say these weren't labeled. I just had blank boxes here and blank boxes there. Could you tell which ones were X's and which ones were Y's? How? Focus on the, the, latent, how the labeling of the latent variables will tell you. And even, even if these weren't labeled, you should be able to tell by the directions of the arrows. You know that circles are latent variables. So look at the directions of how the circles are related to each other. Can you tell which ones are exogenous and which ones are endogenous? Yep. Yep. There's a couple different ways you can tell. One is the arrows, right? So because the arrows are going this way from, you know, from these uh, latent variables to these, these are obviously exogenous, like all the arrows are going away from these, right? These are exogenous, and these then, that makes this one endogenous, this one endogenous, there's arrows going to it. You can only correlate independent variables, you can only correlate exogenous variables. So the fact that we have a correlation between the xi's also tells you that these are exogenous because you can't correlate them otherwise. And notice down here, I don't have a correlation between the eta's, I correlate their errors instead, because the errors are independent, or these are not anymore. Right, so, uh, exogenous variables remain, uh, because they're independent, we can correlate them. So, what makes these X's? Well, because they're the variables indicating the exogenous variables. Right, so, the Xi's are all exogenous, as we just said. These are the measured variables that are making up these exogenous variables, so that makes them X's. Because these Y's are making up, or indicating these two endogenous variables here and here, that makes them Y's. That's it. Which side are they on? Are they on the exogenous latent variable side, or on the endogenous side? That's what makes them, an, uh, defines them as an X or a Y. So, because these I mean, notice they're actually being predicted, so it seems like well, that, that should make this then endogenous, right? Well, but because it's an indicator of an exogenous latent variable, that makes it an X. Where the because these are indicators of 
the endogenous variables that makes them Ys. Okay. Because these factors are indicating or predicting these items, well, what connects the Xi's to X's? Well, the lambda X matrix. If I go back a second. What was lambda X again? Lambda X is the matrix of coefficients regressing X onto Xi. So these, these are loadings. These, these are the factor loadings uh, for the X's. These are the factor loadings for the Y's. So if you notice in this picture, these are labeled, probably, probably can't see very well, labeled Lambda X11, Lambda X21, Lambda X32, Lambda X42, uh, Lambda X53, Lambda X63. Now why? So a couple questions. So these are lambdas, which means these are the factor loadings relating the Xi's to the X's. Why the numbering? Why one one two one three two four two five three six three? What do those numbers represent? So you have the the letters. You have all the, these lambda X's. You have lambda X one one, lambda X two one, lambda X three two, lambda X four two, five three six three. What do those numbers represent? Exactly right. So the first letter tells you wh what X is being predicted. So it's X1. The second number tells you which Xi it's coming from. So this is the X1 predicted by Xi1. This is X2 predicted by Xi1. That's why it switches down here to X3 predicted by Xi2. X4 predicted by Xi2. Right? So it, it tells you where they are. It also tells you in the in the lambda the lambda x matrix, so basically he's also telling you the row and column that they're in as well. What row and column is that component in the matrix? It is so in the, this is in the first row, first column. This is in the second row, first column. This is in the third row, second column. Sense is telling you exactly where the, in the matrix it is because this matrix should be a a. It's going to be an x so a six by xi matrix. Six rows, three columns. So it tells you exactly where in, the, in, the, in that matrix those values are going to be when you're trying to estimate this lambda, the lambda x matrix. So they're lambda x's simply because these are exogenous. That makes these x's exogenous sort of indicators. So we're we're relating the exogenous variables to those to those x variables through this lambda, these lambda values in the lambda x matrix. Okay, so then we have the the Xi's are are exogenous, but we can correlate them. Well, where where do we tell Lisserl? Where in Lisserl language do we specify that I want Xi one and Xi two correlated, Xi two and Xi three correlated, but I don't want Xi one and Xi three to be correlated? So I'm going to do that in the phi matrix. So where's the phi matrix? B matrix is the variances and covariances of exogenous latent variables. So even though it's not listed here, I'm going to estimate a variance for, for, uh, for Xi1, a variance for Xi2, and a variance for Xi3 on the diagonal. This is going to be, because there are three Xi's, it's going to be a three, uh, it's going to be a three by three matrix in which I'm going to tell it that I wanted to, to estimate the variances, but I also want to estimate the, the phi 1, 2, and the phi 3, 2 components of that matrix uh, to specify that I want these to be correlated. The other one, the last one, which is going to be the 3, 1 um, component, is going to be left 0. So I'm saying it, there is, I don't want to estimate anything. I'm saying that I, there's no correlation there. And it's a way to specify exactly where in the matrix those values land. Okay, how do I tell this rule or specify in this rule that I want, I want, these are exogenous, and I want to take Xi1 to Eta1, I'm going to specify that in the gamma matrix. Right, where's that? So gamma is a matrix of coefficients of Xi predicting Eta. Right, so these are the variables in the structure relationship between Xi and Eta. So I want to specify a, an M by n matrix, in this case, three m's and I think two n's. 
three exogenous, two endogenous. So it's going to be a three by T matrix in which I'm going to tell that I want to estimate um, phi one one, phi one two, phi one two, phi two two, and phi two three. Because those are the, the, the gammas that I'm predicting here. Notice there isn't a gamma 1. There's, so there's no gamma going from um, going 2, 2 from 1. So there's no gamma 2, 1, right? It doesn't exist. So in that matrix, we're specifying that to be 0. Or we're saying there's nothing there. There is a 1 from 2. Right, one, two, one from two. But there isn't a, oh no, and there's a two from two. There's a two from three, but there isn't a one from three. So that's zero as well. So this is where you're telling the, these equations where you want to estimate things and where you want to assume that they're zero and leave them out. So that's all in the gamma matrix. The, the, the etas are uh, the endogenous variables. But if you notice, we have uh, eta 2 predicted by eta 1. We're going to specify that in the beta matrix. Go back again. Beta, matrix of coefficients of, of, of eta in structural relationships. So these are the regression coefficients connecting etas to other etas. Okay, that's why it's in the B, the beta T1 there. So we're going to estimate a variance for, uh, actually we're not, because these are endogenous. We're going to, the, the, the variances get kicked out into their errors. So this is a disturbance that's in zeta, uh, in the, the sort of zeta vector, zeta 1 and zeta 2. And we can specify that those two things, we're going we're gonna to estimate a, a variance for zeta 1, a variance for zeta 2, and then we can also specify that we want to estimate in the psi matrix, variances and covariances of endogenous disturbances. All right, so I can, I can actually specify that I want, a, I want a correlation, a covariance between those in that psi matrix. Then we have on the left hand side, we know that y's are indicators of the endogenous variables. Well, how, how are the endogenous measured variables related to the endogenous latent variables? Through the lambda y matrix. This is lambda y11, lambda y21, lambda y32, and lambda y42. And because those are all being predicted by the factors, they're going to push out these unique variances that we find in the epsilon vector and we can even though it's not here i could have i could put a correlation say between these two here or i can correlate these disturbances there but in the in these theta epsilon um, matrices so right now all the variances all the we're estimating the variances of all the epsilons the variances of all the deltas and we're assuming that all the covariances are zero I could actually estimate those by, by telling it that I, I want to estimate a, a covariance, but because we don't have any, all the covariances between the E's are assumed, or the epsilons are assumed to zero, and all the, the covariances among the deltas are assumed to be zero. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a really clean one for the sake of an example. The fact, the fact that every factor only has two indicators is unusual, right? That, that's not, we usually don't have factors with just two items, right? But, so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty simplistic factorial model for list rule, right? But it's not, um, but it, it does sort of demonstrate, I think, pretty well without getting too complicated. This could look like, uh, more like spaghetti, right? You could have, you know, uh, this, an error, error going here, that arrow going there, which you know, which would then mean I think all of the all of the the latent exogenous variables relate to all the the latent endogenous variables. Or you could do that. I think it's done this way partially because they wanted to add in this um, this path here, where it makes more sense to sort of separate them out some. 
because if everything on this side predicted every, predicted the two of these variables together, there wouldn't be very much left over to predict here um, between a to one and a to two, right? Because because these would capture all of the relationships between them by preceding them in the model. We'll get to that sort of later on, but. Yeah, this is a fairly simple model, even though it looks like it's complicated, and just because we have all these crazy uh, matrices and things, but it's actually, this is actually a fairly straightforward, pretty simple model version. So these, uh, so notice I'm not really, I'm not really doing, the, talking about these very much. This is actually in like in the literal program, the, like the, the delta the matrix, right, is is labeled this D I. This one's called for some reason F U. This one's called D. This is another. Oh no, wait. This is talking about default form. I forgot what those stand for. We notice it's like D I F R F I F R. You know what I mean, it's had, this has something to do more specifically with the the software, like how it actually gets put into the software. So don't worry about those these three lines. But the, these are the these is what I started talking about. These are like the, in instead of using the symbols, they use these letters. So in Lystral, the theta epsilon matrix is labeled T E. The lambda Y is L Y. Uh, psi is P S. Uh, beta is B E. Gamma is G A. B is P H. Um, lambda X is uh, L X, and then theta delta is T D. So those are all like their short form, where they sort of label the matrices in the in the program. So the way this sort of starts to, to pan out how we put this together, these are all matrices. The way we sort of start to specify this as a matrix equation is like the measurement model for Y talks about how Y is, pre this is these are the endogenous variables, uh, equal to the loading in lambda Y times the, the ADAs, the endogenous latent variables, plus the unique variances. This is actually how, Y connects to the latent variables as, as the Y measurement component. So we're going to specify one measurement model for Y, a separate measurement model for X, where X's relate to the Xi's via the loadings in the lambda X matrix, plus the errors. These are unique variances around that. So we've got the measurement model for Y's, measurement model for X. And then we have a separate equation, a separate matrix equation where we're tr within relating everything structurally. So, ADAs are the endogenous latent variables, right? So how do those relate? Well, they relate to other endogenous variables through beta, and they relate to exogenous variables through gamma. And then what's left over are the disturbances. And so we're going to predict our ADAs with other ADAs in the beta matrix. We're going to predict ADAs with the Xi's, via the gamma matrix. And then whatever's left over is going to spit out into variances in a variance covariance matrix in this sort of zeta matrix, which is the disturbance. Okay, so this, all this is really doing is just giving us a bunch of uh, you know, matrices that are labeling with Greek letters, which is, I think, part of the confusion. It's like we, we uh, are a bit resistant to it's just because everything, literally, there's a, the phrase is like, oh, it sounds Greek to me, because, because Greek oftentimes is a thing we refer to as being, making it more confusing because everything's sort of in Greek, right? So, so there, there is a bit of a, a mental or psychological thing of trying to sort of get accustomed to these kinds of models, uh, being labeled everything as a Greek letter until you sort of just become comfortable with it. Like we could have called this anything. I could have called this, uh, you know, A, B, C, D. I could have called this by different letters. And it would, it would all mean the same thing. It's just they went to Greek letters because in the models, we're trying to specify what we think is the population, uh, what's going on in the population. So these are our estimated population models. So they use Greek to be consistent with that because we're trying to estimate what's going on in the population. Population parameters are usually labeled as Greek letters. So everything's, everything's in Greek because we're trying to estimate what these these, we're trying to estimate what's going on in the population that could be driving the sample that we have, and that's why we specify everything as sort of Greek letter to sort of make that consistent with everything else we do with population parameters. Okay.